Greetings and welcome to our program, Pilgrim Publications Presents. I'm Larry Wessels, your co-host, and I want to thank you for joining us today. Well, we're going to delve into a, a, what I think is a very awesome topic. And we're going to do a complete series on this topic. And the topic is the biblical doctrine of hell. You don't hear a lot about hell anymore these days. Everybody likes to talk about, you know, Elvis and... <laughs> angels and things of this nature, but uh, we're going to talk about what the Bible says about this awesome doctrine of hell. Does it exist? What is it? What does the Bible say about it? And more importantly, what did Jesus say about it? And with me, of course, here is the director of Pilgrim Publications, author, speaker, lecturer, Bob L. Ross. Bob, it's great to have you here as we get into this uh, rather uh, incredible topic. Larry, it's not the most enjoyable subject that we could discuss so far as appealing to our uh, likes, but uh, it is one of the most prominent doctrines of Christianity, very prominent in the Bible, and very prominent in the teachings of Christ. As a matter of fact, I think Jesus Christ probably taught more on the subject of hell than anyone else, and perhaps that's very appropriate because what more serious subject could there be than the eternal destiny of our souls? And I would prefer to hear it from the lips of the Master than from anyone else that may have had a hand in teaching us or writing the Scriptures. So you're just you're, you're saying this isn't just an invention of the Apostle Paul, I say? No, uh, I think Jesus Christ, if you will read the Scriptures carefully, has more to say about hell than any of the New Testament sources. Yeah, I keep thinking of uh, what he said in, let's say, Matthew 25, particularly around verse 41 and so forth. You got the sheep and the goats, and, and the one will be turned into uh, hell, and the, the burning, and you know, gnashing of teeth, and torture. I mean, he got into all these types of things. So, and the imagery isn't very pleasant. Now, I think the great weight on the doctrine of hell is in the fact that man's conscience also bears witness to the testimony of the existence of hell. There's two things that sometimes men try to avoid and yet their conscience will not let them escape it. And one of them is that there is a God to whom they're responsible. And the other is there is a hell after this life which they need to be concerned about and they need to avoid. And those two things, regardless of how men fight it and resist it and distort it, they uh, find that their conscience will not leave them alone. And they have to find, seek some salve, some escape, some solution. And whether they find it or not all depends upon what they accept as being the truth about the particular thing that we call hell and the particular subject which the Bible calls salvation. And uh, so that's what we're here to try to focus attention on. The Bible does assert the fact of hell, and the Bible also tells us that we uh, should escape hell. We should flee to Jesus Christ to escape hell. What shall a man profit it, be profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? going down to an eternal uh, punishment in hellfire. I'd like to draw our, our studio audience, or actually uh, not our studio audience, but our audience out there in TV land, to this chart to uh, analyze some of the different beliefs about, uh, that, well, that people have about hell. And we'll come here to this first one. Uh, we've all heard of the Jehovah's Witnesses and how they knock on your door usually on Saturday morning. And uh, they have an idea about hell that's very interesting. Uh, according to number one here, it says, No symbol of everlasting torment, symbolic of complete destruction, no resurrection of life as a soul being possible. This, is, this comes from the Jehovah's Witness uh, Aid to Bible Understanding, pages uh, 633 and 634. So, Bob, here we have an idea from this particular religious group that, well, there's no torment, hell doesn't represent torment, and uh, you just you know, you just cease to exist, basically. I guess it's a concept called annihilationism. 
Well, this has an appeal to people, Larry, because people are concerned about hell. Uh, they may not go to church, they may not read their Bibles, they may not be religiously inclined, but uh, they can't get away from hell. I mean, the man on the street lets them hear the word every day. Uh, television, radio, uh, newspapers, magazines, that word hell keeps popping up. And they just can't escape the fact of hell. And so uh, uh, this has an appeal to people who want to avoid, who want to escape, who want some solution to the problem without uh, maybe uh, responding to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why they come in their repertoire. One of the main things is uh, we're going to tell you that there's no such thing as hell. Uh, and that seems to appeal to people that, hey, here's a good religion, no hell. So I don't have to worry about that anymore, so tell me more. <laughs> and before you know it, they've got a hook on the line, they've got a fish on the line, and they reel it in, and they take them down to the kingdom hall, and from there on, uh, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> right. But now with the second one, let's go back to our chart here for the folks at home. Uh, we have a different religion, and, and this is from the Mormon religion, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and they say, uh, talking about hell and so, so forth. They suffer the torments of the damned. Hell will have an end. The great majority of those who have suffered in hell will pass into the telestial kingdom. End quote. That comes from Apostle Bruce R. McConkie from his book Mormon Doctrine, pages 349 and page 350. So here's a concept of hell that, well, there's some punishment and torment, but it's going to end. It kind of like has a, like a time clock on it, and then you'll eventually get out. Larry, I'm always suspicious about uh, anything that might be said by someone who comes along using the word in front of their name, apostle. Uh, I hear a lot of people uh, in radio or magazines or books and television, sometimes they want to come on and they'll use the word apostle or prophet or some embellishing term as if to give their words more weight and authority than what they really are, just the words of a man. These are not terms that you find in Scripture, ladies and gentlemen. These are terms that you find in a book written by a common man, such as you and me, and uh, they do not have weight and authority, such as the inspired Word of God. You will not find the statement, they suffer the torments of the damned hell will have an end, uh, and so on. These are the words of a man who, although he claims to be an apostle, he more appropriately could be called an apostate because he is drifting away from. That's what the word apostate means, to go away from. He is going away from the teachings of the Bible. So he is an apostate rather than an apostle. Very well said. And now point three here, Bob, we, we, we're taking this now from another religious persuasion, mainly the uh, mind science religions, this one specifically being the Unity School of Christianity, uh, which has that idea of religious uh, science, uh, mind science. And what they say is, one does not have to die in order to go to hell any more than one has to die to go to heaven. If one's mental processes are out of harmony with the law of man's being, they result in trouble and sorrow. This is hell. That comes from the Unity School of Christianity's book, Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, written by Charles Fillmore, founder of that particular group, uh, from page 271. Any comments here, Bob? Well, Larry, I have no objection to people exercising the freedom of intellect and the freedom of uh, reason and the freedom of their own individuality within religion and science or philosophy or whatever. But what I object to with regard to this kind of a statement is attaching the name of Christ to it, attaching the idea of Christianity to it and using the word Bible. Uh, these things are not taught in the Bible. These things were not taught by Jesus Christ. These things were not taught by historic Christianity, the Orthodox Christian Church that has existed uh, through the years. This is a distortion, a rejection, a perversion 
in the name of Christianity and in the name of the Bible. Uh, like I say, I have no objection to people believing this. If that's their choice, if that's what they believe is the truth, then of course they should believe this as a matter of their uh, personal committal to what they think is the truth. But when they start saying this is what the Bible says or this is what Christ taught or this is what Christianity teaches, then they go contrary to honesty, integrity, and ethics. They should face up to the fact that we are not indeed Christians. We're not indeed biblical. We're not indeed representatives of historic Christianity. We are a new movement. We are an off branch. We are a distorted movement. And just drop the name of Christ altogether. But uh, then they wouldn't uh, be uh, the, the typical wolves in sheep's clothing. Well, of course, that, of course, <laughs> that that's that's the ultimate fact of the matter is that they are trying to embellish their false teaching by using the name of Christ, mm -hmm. because they know by doing this they can. You remember when you go fishing as a kid, Larry? You, you had the worm there, and you spit on the worm, thinking that the spit would. Uh, help some way flavor up that worm so the fish would bite it. Well, that's what they're doing with the, with the name of Christ. In effect, they're spitting on the worm. They're using the name of Christ to cover up their bait here, and they want to reel in the unsuspecting, naive Christian or professing Christian, as the case may be. Uh, I think most of the people that respond to these kind of philosophies are really only professors and not possessors. And I base that on scripture which says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and a stranger they will not follow. Well, uh, John says in one of his epistles that those who depart from the Christian faith, they go out from us because they were not of us. If they'd been of us, of the same salvation experience and indwelling of the Holy Spirit that indwells believers, they would not have gone out from us. They would have remained with us. I think that's First John 2.19 if I remember. So. Yes, I believe it is. Well, uh, you're talking about people who claim to be Christians, but now what about this number point number four here? This is definitely people who not, do not claim to be Christians at all. This next quote is coming from Madeline Murray O'Hare from her book, What on Earth is an Atheist? Page 178. And uh, it says, the unsoundness of the Christian scheme is uh, apparent upon its face. In order to sell the product, they should really promise something here and now and not try to frighten anyone into an acceptance of a group of ideas by the threat of eternal fire, brimstone, and agony, end quote, coming from Madeline Murray O'Hare. So, uh, Bob, what do you have to say about that? Well, Larry, uh there's something about Mrs. O'Hare that you and I uh, have in common with her, I'm sure, and that is that all of us have a capacity of fear. And fear is not exactly a bad capacity or ability or, uh, or uh, intuitive thing to have within us because fear sometimes, uh, in many instances, I could think of how that fear is a blessing to us. Uh, many things in life that if we do fear them, we can take measures to protect ourselves from them and consequently we can avoid the disaster and the harm that comes from these things. And we teach children, for instance, to be afraid of fire. And I'm saying that in the sense of being afraid of fire in the right sense. We teach people to be afraid of loaded guns, uh, to be afraid of them in the sense of respecting the danger that's involved in a loaded gun. We teach people to be afraid of high speed on the highway. We teach people to be afraid of floodwaters and, and we teach them to build their houses in such a place and in such a manner that if a flood comes, the floods will not take advantage of them in this and cause them physical and uh, natural disaster and so on. So there are many things that we should have a healthy respect and fear for. And one of them is Almighty God and what He has revealed to us with regard to the life to come. Of all things, the eternity that lies ahead of us has to be one of the most important things that we could consider and uh, give respect and uh, fear to as to our well-being. 
And anyone who says, oh, well, I have no fear of the life beyond. I have no fear of hell. I have no fear of God. Uh, there's a scripture that says fools make a mock at sin. Fools make a mock of the consequences of sin. And uh, uh, these kind of philosophies that say, well, we're just teaching people to uh, fear these things and to uh, be religious out of a sense of fear. No, we're trying to teach them to respect what God's Word reveals about this subject and to consider where do they stand if this is the truth. If it's the truth, where do I stand in relation to it? And uh, I'm satisfied that Mrs. O'Hare has had her share of fears in life, just as we all have had our fears. And uh, one thing that I think in due course of time that she and all others will eventually do is what Paul said in Romans, that we'll all bow the knee to Jesus Christ and confess him, Lord. And uh, that will indeed be a time of fear, uh, reverence, and respect for the Son of God. Unfortunately, many of those people who will be brought into this type of uh, acknowledgement will be brought into it uh, after they have called to the mountains and the rocks to fall on them for fear of the face of him who sitteth on the throne because they are not Christians. They are not saved. And the sad thing about it all is that it need not be. If Mrs. O'Hare would follow the same example that her son and confess Jesus Christ as Savior, she would find that uh, relief from any fear of hell comes not as a result of being afraid of hell, but as a result of uh, having a fear of the Son of God in the sense of respect for Him as the Savior, as the Lord, and as the Scripture says, kiss the Son, lest He be angry with thee. That's Psalm 2. Psalm 2. That's right. Okay, well, this last one then, to wrap this up on just various beliefs, uh, another non-Christian uh, religion uh, I, I believe atheism is a religion. <laughs> Here's another non-Christian religion. Uh, this is coming from uh, the Prophet Muhammad of Islam. And uh, basically we're getting this translation. It's coming from the translation of the meaning of the Sahih al-Bukhari, edited by Muhammad Klan. And uh, uh, this is what Muhammad said in one of his uh, 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 hadiths. And uh, he said, the Prophet said, I was shown the hellfire and that the majority of its dwellers were women. Oh, women, I have not seen anyone more deficient in intelligence and religion than you. End quote. That's coming from, of course, the Prophet Muhammad of Islam. Uh, any concluding remarks on this, Bob? Well, Larry, of course, uh, Islam and its Prophet Muhammad are in many, many respects diametrically opposed to Christianity and the Bible and the Son of God, they do not accept Jesus Christ as the eternal Son of God. And so we have a, a complete different foundation upon which our faith rests and upon which Islam rests. Uh, they do, in a, in a sense, say, oh, well, we have a respect for Christ and a certain interpretation about Christ. But they plainly in all of their writings and in their messages, they deny that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. So uh, we're listening to here the one that we're obligated to think of in terms of the Bible as a false prophet, one who is not expounding the scriptures uh, of the Bible. And in fact, uh, this particular faith indicates in their writings that they are going to correct the errors of the early writers of the Bible. And uh, they depend upon uh, so-called revelations that Muhammad claimed and uh, inspiration that he supposedly had. Well, I find it interesting here where he cast, it seems like women are ending up in hell because they're deficient in intelligence and religion. It, it, just this flies in the face of the biblical record, which you find in, uh, particularly, I think it's in Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 28, if my memory serves me correctly, well, where we're all one in Christ, male nor female. Uh, well, Larry, uh, I, I really can't object to this statement here in one sense because Muhammad is saying, I have not seen anyone more deficient in intelligence. He's saying, I have not seen. Well, that may have been. Uh, Muhammad's experience 
that uh, in his association with people, he had not seen anyone. And sometimes I wonder, Larry, anyone who would follow the teachings of Muhammad if this would not apply not only to the women, but also to the men. <laughs> because they are very deficient in intelligence and religion if you judge them by the Bible. Now, I'm not saying that to cast a slur upon their intellect, but uh, I've read the life of Muhammad. I've read the claims of Muhammad. I've read, I've read the Quran of Muhammad. And I, frankly, Larry, cannot see how anyone with intelligence and religion could accept these things as being from God. So, uh, in other words, I, in order to believe Muhammad, <laughs> you'd have to be deficient in intelligence and religion. Is well, that what you're well, I'm still saying, I'm still <laughs> saying that Muhammad here is giving his testimony about the women that he observed during his time. I, I read a book about Muhammad and his wives uh, called Aisha, the Beloved of Muhammad, and it told about a lot of the inner conflicts between these wives that Muhammad had and how that on one occasion one of his wives Aisha was accused of uh, immorality and there was a withdrawal period in which Muhammad went away for like a month or so from her and uh, she was uh, sorrowful and pouting of course and uh, in due course of time Muhammad gets this revelation from Allah that Aisha is innocent so he comes back and I'm just thinking well now how in the world can people uh, accept these kind of things that are obviously, uh, in my opinion, fables that uh, have been spun off. How could people accept this kind of uh, uh, story? But they do it. So maybe Muhammad is telling us the truth so far as his circle of association with women was concerned. We're so we could spend the rest of our time talking about Muhammad's ideas easily, but uh, we'll have to save that for another series. But uh, those comments are well taken, and of course, uh, you in no way are implying that uh, women in general are deficient in intelligence. The biblical concept of women is completely different than the concept that Muhammad presents to us. This is correct. We have, we have for instance, uh, I think one of the most glorious passages in all the Bible, the last chapter of Proverbs, isn't it? It speaks of, of, of a woman. Proverbs and, 31. And, and, and any woman who follows in the pattern of Proverbs 31, uh, I mean, this is God's testimony to the dignity and the glory of what womanhood can be. But then again, on the other side of the coin, we have uh, the strange woman presented in the scripture. We have the bad woman presented in the scripture. And this is one of the doors to hell uh, the book of Proverbs teaches us that her her house is the way to hell. And we know that this is implying that the immorality which this woman makes, a, makes merchandise of her body sexually, this invites people to go down the pathway, the gateway to hell according to the book of Proverbs. That's right. I think that's Proverbs 6 if my memory is right. There's several chapters in early Proverbs that deal with it. That's right. All right, uh, well, let's uh, get to more of a biblical definition, if I, uh, I can, uh, here for the viewing audience, and start uh, expounding on that a little bit. But, uh, well, let me just go ahead and go to our chart right here for the viewers at home. We have a definition here uh, for hell, from what we believe is a biblical perspective, an eternal furnace of fire, both material and spiritual, where the inhabitants of hell are tortured in mind and body by God, by every rational creature or being in the universe, and the damned themselves. Their memories and lusts torture them, as well as their own active consciences. Okay, so that's how they, uh, the damned themselves torture themselves, just from their own memories and their lusts. And of course, uh, the rational beings in the universe and by God himself uh, and we'll be expounding on all of this and of course down here we have a little uh, footnote the damned in hell would give if they could the world and all that is in it to have the number of their sins reduced by one now we'll make one admission here if I could for the viewing audience a lot of this material here or this definition comes from uh, the great uh, American theologian Jonathan Edwards, and I have a book here entitled Heaven and Hell, uh, written by John Gershner, covering uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards on the afterlife. And, and some of this material here comes straight from the, the uh, great American theologian Jonathan Edwards, 
who was one of the instrumental leaders in the Great Awakening that took place back in the uh, uh, 18th century and so forth. But uh, we're just touching the surface here on this definition of hell. It's not something we're going to completely expound upon in this program. We're, uh, we're, we're mainly dealing in this program with a lot of the concepts and views of hell and, and dealing with those first. And then we're going to get into, in further shows in this series, the actual uh, definitions of some of the things that you find in this definition, uh, the attributes, and uh, other uh, scriptural relevant uh, passages that deal with this subject. So we'll, we'll get into that in future shows, but not at this point in time. I just wanted to lay that on the table for your looking at it in consideration, and we'll expound upon it a little later. What I'd like to do here, uh, which will deal uh, in a big way, I think, with the whole idea of hell, is to spend the rest of our time, which is flying rapidly, Bob, <laughs> on the concept that a lot of people come up with. And we kind of covered it already in some of these initial ideas about hell from these uh, other religious persuasions. But this whole idea of annihilationism, uh, this concept that when you die, you cease to exist. That, well, God is, is too loving of a God to send anybody to an everlasting burning hell or a, a, you know, a furnace of fire or something like this where people are tormented. God's too loving for that sort of thing. So what he, what he does instead is he just, when you, if you're wicked or whatever, you just cease to exist. And this is a, a very popular idea. Not only is this idea popular among uh, religious cults, but even within uh, evangelical Christianity, there are some uh, big-name writers who have now gone over to this view. I think of people like, uh, uh, you may be familiar with a few of these, uh, I think F.F. F. Bruce uh, tilted that way, as well as John Stott. You may have heard of uh, some of these men uh, going over to this view. They didn't hold it before, but now they are, and there's been others that I think of Clark Pinnock, who at one point held to the traditional view of, uh, of hell, and now he's gone over to more of an annihilationist view. Uh, well, Bob, what we want to do is go to another chart, which I'll uh, now bring up. And I want us to start discussing, from a biblical perspective, uh, this whole aspect of annihilationism. I think uh, this is a major hurdle that we have to deal with in order to get into the, the other attributes of God, or attributes of hell. Because if we don't deal with this, then a lot of people uh, have a tendency to slough off a lot of the clear and relevant passages. But if they don't have annihilationism to hold on to, then these other passages we'll bring up to, to describe hell in all its attributes, its awesome attributes, I think will hold water. And uh, so, uh, for the folks at home, let us, let us go to this chart. Uh, it's just simply entitled, A Refutation of Annihilationism. This idea that you cease to exist. That's a big word, Larry. Uh, why don't you kind of break it up and tell us what it means? Well, I, 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 so, I <laughs> sort of did for the folks at home. Annihilationism simply means there, it's the concept that you are annihilated. You are totally destroyed. You cease to exist. You go out of existence. You have no consciousness, consciousness of anything. You're like a dead dog thrown in a ditch. You know not anything. And in fact, I believe a lot of annihilationists, the soul sleepers, people that think you just go unconscious, they, they jump to places in Ecclesiastes, for instance, and just say you, you, you don't know anything, everything's just like it was, I guess, before you were born. And that's this whole idea of annihilationism. And now what we're going to try to do in the 20 minutes or so left to us is uh, see if the Bible goes along with this view or refutes this view. And then from there we can move in through this series into discussing more about all the other ramifications of hell. But Bob, first of all, on the, on the chart, we, we have a point here. It says the Bible talks about endless punishment. And we have a couple of references here. We have in Revelation 14, uh, verses 10 and 11. And we also have uh, Revelation uh, chapter 20 verse 10 and those passages of scripture and revelation talk about uh, I guess the concept of endless punishment could you uh, 
Could you talk a little bit about this idea of end endless punishment? Uh, first of all, Larry, with regard to the men who have been uh, supportive of this view and uh, any uh, individuals as well as collection of individuals, churches or religions or denominations, I think we have a word that's been popularized in recent times that in a psychological sense would uh, uh, categorize these people and that word is what's called denial. There are many things in life that are tragedies, that are uh, circumstances, that are uh, things that we have done or do that we want to deny the existence of these things as a means of escape and as a means of avoiding the consequences of these things. And I think in the area of hell, we actually are dealing here, Larry, with a psychological reaction on the part of man to a biblical doctrine. And that psychological reaction is rooted in the fact that I don't think any of us are inherently desirous of seeing either ourselves or other people suffer. I don't think that any of us would want to think of one of our children, for example, one of our own family, as being deserving of hell, as it's described in the scriptures. And uh, I think that probably extends to other people as well. We do not desire bad things to happen to other people in general. I know every once in a while we have some distorted person that may be so deranged that he likes to see other people suffer. But generally speaking, uh, I think the human race has this tendency to want to, uh, other people in the human race to uh, be in good health and to enjoy life and not to suffer uh, consequences in life that would make things miserable for them and hurtful and uh, so on. Well, um, but how are we going to deal with the fact that we do have these awful tragedies that come upon us? We have these horrible things that happen to people. Uh, they have uh, plane crashes, for instance, just in recent times where the airplanes nosedive straight into the ground and the bodies just scattered to smithereens and we just shiver inside ourselves thinking about uh, the experience that must have been when this plane was diving to the ground. I guess actually that was more miserable to them than the actual crash itself. But uh, then we think of people I heard on the radio as I was traveling to the studio today about someone burning up in a house fire and how horrible that would be to burn up and uh, we do, but we cannot deny the existence of these things or the reality of these well, how things. How can a loving God allow these things to happen? Well, that's, that's the, the thing that we also have to answer when we come to hell. Uh, why, how could God send people or allow people or whatever to go to hell? And uh, it's not to be determined by how we might feel about it, no more than the fact that if your house burns down, you're going to be suffering in the agonies of the fire as that house burns down. Uh, just because you don't like it and just because the idea is something that you reject as wanting in your life, it doesn't mean that the fire is going to stop burning and you're going to stop suffering. And uh, so just to uh, uh, take the element of human nature that rejects these things as being something you want to accept into your life willingly, just because you're, you're going to deny them, it doesn't mean that the reality is still not there. And hell is one of those things that we just have to face, just like we have to face uh, a child that's born deformed, just like we have to face an accident that's happened to someone who's deprived them of an arm or a leg or eyesight, just as a, a tragedy would happen that would uh, bring the end of one's death at the age of a very young, relatively young age. I've had this experience with one of my young infant children. You've had an experience of this kind in your family where you've had a child that wasn't born uh, in a normal type physical 
uh, body and other people have had their tragedies. Well, just by uh, saying, well, I'm not going to believe this. I'm not going to accept this. Uh, I'm going to come up with a philosophy that does away with all this. Does that answer to it? Does that bring my child back from the dead? Does that cure your child? Does that cause the fire to stop burning? And so just because someone comes up with a theory that uh, we call, they call annihilationism here to explain away what is obvious in the Bible, that is simply another psychological denial I wish, I wish that it could be true, from my point of view, that no one would go to hell. I mean, why should I want anyone to go to hell? Uh, I would have them all saved and somehow all their sins taken care of, them, even if they uh, don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. I would hope I could find some way to get them out of it and relieve them. Uh, someone said one time, well, if there's not a hell, there ought to be for certain kinds of people. But... Even those kind of people, I would, I would desire that they would be changed some way and make them acceptable. So it, it, it's an appeal to an element in the human nature of man. And it's an appeal to the human nature of man. And uh, that's all it is. All right, Bob. I very well said. I would like to mention for the uh, viewers at home, we have these two references here, Revelation 14, 10, and 11. I'll read that for you right now. It says here, reading from a King James Bible, it says, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now that sounds like endless punishment to me. And then looking over here in Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, it uh, states, if I can find it here, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So, just for the folks at home, our first point, the Bible talks about endless punishment. Bob just went into a, a great exposition on why you can just re choose not to believe it, but that doesn't mean it's going to go away. You know, I can get the measles and hope they go away, but, uh, you know, I keep scratching and itching, and they're still there no matter how much I want them to go away, and they go away when they feel like going away, I guess, but it doesn't change the reality of it. Uh, but... Uh, Bob, we're rapidly running out of time for the show, and we've got a lot of points here. So what I'm going to do is uh, briefly run through them all, and then we're going to come back with our remaining time and have you start expounding, as you will, on the different points as you see fit to talk about them. But for the folks at home, with our time running out, I want to get through these points quickly and then give uh, Bob some time to elaborate on anything here you might want to talk about. But let's go through these now uh, quickly. Uh, point number two the damned are sensible of their punishment. In other words, Jesus in many places talks about the gnashing of teeth, the torment. You know, we have the rich man crying out in torment there in Luke 16 and so forth. Uh, uh, there's, there's agony here in, uh, with, the, uh, with the damned, and you find that throughout the scripture. Okay, uh, uh, number three, degrees of punishment. There's, there's different degrees of punishment. Some people will receive greater damnation than others. We find Jesus saying that in Matthew chapter 23. We find in Luke chapter 12 verses 47 and 48 about one servant will receive uh, many stripes and the other one will receive few stripes. We find in uh, Matthew chapter 5 verse 22 you have degrees of punishment there where uh, Jesus is talking about how well if you do this to a brother you'll go before the court but if you call him a fool or a raka then you're in danger of the hell fire. There's de escalating degrees of punishment for the things you do to other people or, or how you treat your neighbor there in Matthew 5.22. So there's degrees of punishment in hell. Uh, point four we have annihilationism is no state at all. It's a state of non-existence actually. Inconsistent with man's immortal soul. The soul is more than just the body. Revelation 6, 9, and 10. And also in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, you, you find that uh, there are people there, particularly in Revelation, who are the souls of 
uh, of just men and, and those uh, under the throne of God crying out, you know, how long, O oh Lord, will you not judge those on the earth and so forth? Uh, so here's obviously people who have died, but we find that their souls are in heaven uh, and the earth is still going on and the wicked are still on that earth. Okay, and point five, men would never know their punishment if they were just annihilated. God will repay the sinner face to face. And of course, uh, Romans 12, 19, it says, uh, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And if, uh, they were, if they simply cease to exist, how will they know what kind of punishment they got for? I mean, every man would get the same kind of punishment. It'd be, uh, it would be even all along the line. Now, uh, uh, Bob, did you have any brief comments on these before I go to the other side? Well, I think the point of the whole chart is that God is a just God. Men will not receive what their sins or lives have not truly merited. Uh, sometimes you have heard the statement, maybe a man says, well, all I want is justice. All I want is a fair hearing. I just want to be dealt with according to what uh, I deserve. Well, God indeed is just and uh, he who knows the thoughts and the words and the deeds of our lives, certainly he is going to let those things speak for themselves. I think uh, if we would just stop and reflect on it for a moment of time with regard to God's records of human history, uh, you know, we have today, we're all familiar with video. Things can be captured on video hour by hour. Uh, for instance, world history right now, at least the most significant parts of world history, for the past few years probably could be totally run off on video or a record of it could be done. And uh, I, I think that word video means a, a vision from God. And uh, God's record books are one great video, Larry, of our thoughts, words, and deeds. Amen. Amen. Well, with that said, Bob, let's go to the, our remaining points here dealing with this annihilationism uh, question. Point six on the chart says, hell is going on at the present time. And of course, we have uh, passages like Revelation 20, 13, Luke uh, 16, that's the rich man Lazarus, uh, Luke uh, 23, uh, 43. Uh, we find that uh, when men die, they go to Hades. They go to a place where they await the final judgment uh, that they'll find in Revelation chapter 20, the great right, white throne judgment, where the books are open and each man will be judged. It, it's it's kind of like a fellow who gets arrested, Larry, and he's in the city jail and finally winds up in the Huntsville Penitentiary after the trial. City jail, county jail, finally the Huntsville Penitentiary. Well, the present hell described by Jesus in Luke 16 is not the final hell. The final hell comes in Revelation 20. And this one will be emptied out. They'll go before the judgment bar and then the degrees of punishment there will be determined. Then they'll go into the eternal punishment. That's right, that's right. Okay, number seven. It would have been, now this is a quote from Jesus Christ himself. It would have been good for that man, he's talking about Judas Iscariot here, of course. It would have, uh, it would have been good for that man if he had not been born, end quote, coming from Mark 14, 21. And of course, we also know from many places that the righteous many times suffer more than wicked people in this life. You get that in Psalm 73, for instance. Now, if people were annihilated, how can Jesus say it would have been good if he had not been born? If he's going to be annihilated just like anybody else, Hey, it, it would have been better at least to have lived, even if you'd done a bunch of wicked things, than not to have lived at all. So uh, this, this whole idea refutes annihilationism. Because if there is annihilationism, this wouldn't make any sense. It wouldn't make any sense to say it wouldn't have been good if he'd been born. Well, we've only got five minutes, so I'm going to kind of race through the rest of these, and then we'll make our final comments. It says here, uh, uh, what is the meaning of the burning furnace? He to the differing degrees if none were ever to be cast into it. That's uh, spoken of by Jesus in Matthew 13, 42 and 50. Also, we find this burning uh, furnace in Revelation 9, 2. Uh, if, Jesus, if judgment begins in a household of God, 1 Peter 4, 17, then where will the unjustified sinner stand? I mean, if, if he's just going to cease to exist, how come the, the righteous get judged? 
and the other guy just ceases to exist and he's, he, he doesn't uh, get any justice for the kind of evil he did. And then uh, number 10 here, why did Jesus Christ have to die for us when no punishment is threatened? If you're not going to suffer degrees of punishment, greater damnation as Jesus talked about, you're not going to receive many stripes, you're not going to get, you know, uh, like it says, I think, at the end of Ecclesiastes, every man was judged according to his works. Uh, you, you know, it'll be recompense to you what, what evil you did. Yeah, I know from uh, studying a lot in the Old Testament, uh, a lot of the evil done, God brought it back on their own heads the, for the evil they did, so forth. Uh, if, if you're just annihilated, you cease to exist. None of this stuff would make any sense whatsoever. And of course, we have some key scriptures here on the. Uh, and we'll just show this to the people at home, just for their, uh, if they would like to write these down and dealing with this whole idea of uh, annihilationism, particularly the Mount of Transfiguration mentioned in Matthew uh, 17 verses 1 through 3, where you have Elijah and Moses appearing to Jesus, and he's communing with them. Now, if they cease to exist, <laughs> what is he doing talking to them? Uh, you have uh, Luke 23, 42 and 43, Acts chapter 7, verses 55 through 60, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 8, Philippians 1, 21 through 23, Hebrews 12, 23 through 24, 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20, and Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And I wish we had time to read every one of these scriptures on this show right now, but the time is simply not there to do so. But these scriptures, for those who will write them down and, and read them for yourselves at home, you will find that this idea of annihilation or soul sleep or being unconscious when you die just does not hold up when these kinds of questions are asked or these kind of scriptures are looked up. Now, Bob, we got about two or three minutes left here. Uh, would you like to make any uh, final comments? Well, I, Larry, I figure that some people have been asking the question, well, how could a burning furnace be heated to different degrees? Uh, it looks like it would do the same thing to one it was due for another. And we have a biblical precedent of how God is able to control all things such as this so that uh, there's justice meted out. Remember the story in the book of Daniel chapter 3 about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were cast into the fiery furnace. That's right. And the very men who cast them into the furnace were slain by the tremendous heat. Because they heated it seven times hotter than it usually right. was. And they were slain by the heat while they were casting Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire. But, on the other hand, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even the clothes they were wearing, did not have the smell of smoke upon them. So that shows you that God, in his own power, can regulate according to what his purpose is. And his purpose in meeting out justice to men in eternity with regard to punishment uh, although there's this common burning furnace, as it's described in the 13th chapter of Matthew, a furnace of fire, Jesus called it. And these are not words that we invented. These are words that we accept from the Son of God. Uh, God is able to justly mete out the punishment, just as in the Old Testament, Daniel 3, he did this miracle. Very good. Very well said. Well, Bob, we're down to our less than a minute here to go. And... Uh, I'd uh, just like to uh, ask those people to consider these things. There's uh, many more things we'd like to say, but our time's running out. Uh, we will have a short segment after this that will expound a little bit more. But uh, we've been discussing the subject here of annihilationism and how it cannot hold up. And in fact, Bob, you just mentioned the fiery furnace with uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Why could a, how could a loving God kill those men that threw him in there and let them live at the same time? It seems like he's being unjust there. He's letting uh, one group of men die and the other ones live. But this all ties in with this whole concept of ju judgment here. Well, anyway, I want to thank you all for, for viewing. Stay tuned for our short segment after this. I'm Larry Wessels with Bob L. Ross, and stay tuned next week when we get into this subject some more as we continue on this topic of the biblical doctrine of hell. God bless you. Well, uh, the show's not quite over yet. I hope you enjoyed that segment that Bob Ross and myself did on the reality of hell and the attributes of hell. And we want to, with this time remaining, we want to reiterate a little bit more about the subject and talk a little bit more about the necessity of coming to Christ and also some of the materials and things that uh, Pilgrim Publications has to offer for those that are viewing would like to know more and, and obtain more information on this subject. So uh, with that, 
Uh, I'm here, of course, still with uh, Bob L. Ross, Director of Pilgrim Publications. And uh, Bob, we, the, the people have just seen a, uh, one of our shows on hell, and uh, we have a chart here that gets into some of the, the material we were just talking about and some of the other things. Uh, but just to reiterate a little bit for the folks at home, I'll, I'll mention a few things from this chart, and then we're going to mention uh, a little bit more about the necessity of coming to Jesus Christ to avoid this place that's mentioned so much throughout the scriptures, uh, a place that's mentioned far more than heaven is ever mentioned. Jesus talked a lot more about hell than he ever did about heaven. And if we're going to take Jesus seriously, we have to take the reality of hell seriously. And just to uh, mention once again for any of our viewers that may have just tuned in, uh, our chart here mentions several verses. Uh, we won't go into the the whole extent of all the verses, but these are just a few. We find here in Psalm 11:6, it says, a storm of burning coals of fire, just talking about hell. In Isaiah 33, 11, a place where their breath will be as a living flame. Matthew 8, 12, a place of weeping. Mark 9, 48, a place where the worm dieth not. Notice how I'm mentioning a place, a place, a place. It, it's a literal place, just like right now in the studio, we're in a place. Hell is a place. Okay, John 5, 29, a place for damnation. Daniel 12, 2, a place of shame and everlasting contempt. Matthew 5.22, a place of hellfire. Revelation 2.11, a place of the second death. Well, uh, Brother Bob, we've uh, talked a lot about hell already for the people that have watched the, the previous segment. Could you just elaborate for our viewers a little bit more about why it's so necessary to come to the Lord Jesus Christ to, ava uh, to uh, avoid a place like this? Well, Larry, when I think of this subject, I also think of a, another teaching in the Bible with regard to the attitude that many people have regarding the teachings of the Bible and the things of God and the things that are vital to our soul and to our welfare. And that teaching is the uh, foolishness that man has many times with regard to vital eternal truths. And there's a scripture that uh, keeps coming to my mind on this subject in, in the Proverbs chapter 14 verse 9 fools make a mock at sin but among the righteous there is favor men have a tendency to want to uh, uh, sidetrack the teachings of the Bible men have a tendency to want to uh, put their heads in the sand and put off and to procrastinate and to delay uh, preparing themselves or facing up to the uh, condition of their souls before God with respect to eternity. And uh, when we think about a subject like hell, it's uh, not something that we want, would want to mock. It's not something that we would want to set aside. It's not something that we would want to delay about and to put ourselves in danger. Uh, people will buy automobile insurance, they will buy fire insurance for their homes, they will buy insurance for this and that and the other, but in all of their insuring themselves, many times they completely forget about the most important and the most endurable of all things, and that is their souls. So it is a making a mockery of God, of sin and its consequences of the uh, eternity that we all are facing and whether we whether we want to be religious or Christian or whatever uh, we want to be in this world you cannot avoid death and the life beyond and uh, people say well I don't believe this I don't believe that that doesn't determine anything with respect to the future and if this Bible is true, if what this Bible teaches us with regard to eternity, with regard to sin, with regard to our having to stand before God, we need to accept it and we need to face it and we need to ask the question, what must I do to be saved? And in this book we find that the way of salvation from hell and from sin is through Jesus Christ. And uh, God has loved us enough that he sent Christ to die for our sins. 
And by accepting him by faith, by relying upon him, and by accepting him, I mean to bow to him as your Lord, bow to him as your Savior, accept what he has done in your behalf as your righteousness before God, not trying to offer to God things that you might do or some other person might do or persons might do, but you are going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation. I had a lady this week trying to tell me that I had to do certain things to be saved. And I said, in other words, you're telling me that Jesus is not enough. Well, I want to uh, say to our listeners today and our viewers that Jesus is enough. Jesus is all there is. He is all in all. And once we have received him, accepted him by faith, then we have no fear of hell. The fear of hell is gone. Years ago, I wrote a little article, I'm not afraid of hell anymore. And in that article, I told about how at one time when I was uh, a youngster, I used to uh, be very fearful of hell. And I would have uh, nightmares, as it were, about uh, the torments of hell. But once I was saved, that was taken away from me. Once I trusted Christ, that was taken away from me. I realized that all of my sins for which I would be punished have been punished in Christ. Amen to that. Well, Bob, we're down to uh, less than a couple of minutes here. Uh, could we, just for the sake of the viewers, uh, mention some of the things that Pilgrim Publications has to offer for those that are watching it that might like some material? Larry, we have a little track which I put together on the reality of hell, and then we have a message by C.H. Spurgeon on this subject, Turn or Burn, and we have several other little sermon booklets by C.H. Spurgeon, An Earnest Warning Against Lukewarmness, Trembling at the Word of the Lord, A Catechism with Proofs, for whom did Christ die? And then one more, a sermon for the worst man on earth. You may be thinking that you deserve to go to hell. But uh, Jesus Christ said that he would accept, he would receive, he would save all who come to him. And you needn't think of yourself as being beyond the grace and mercy of God because the grace and mercy of God is greater and wider and deeper and stronger than any of your sins and Jesus Christ can wash them all away and make you whiter than snow. And so if you feel like I'm the worst man on earth or I belong in that category, here's a message you might like to read. It will help show you the way to Jesus Christ and salvation. And these are free. Uh, we'll send you free copies of them. Our address is Pilgrim Publications, Box 66, Pasadena, Texas, 77501. Write us for these sermons. Thank you for that, Bob. And with that, I'd just like to remind our listening audience that uh, uh, you can call or write the numbers or address at the end of the show for that information. We'll be glad to send it to you free. Uh, I would like to let you know that uh, now is the day, now is the time for salvation. Seek God while he, while he may be found. Don't put it off. Well, I'm Larry Wessels with Bob L. Ross for Pilgrim Publications Presents. Join us again next time. God bless you.